بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على محمد خاتم النبيين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأهل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم افتح فتوه العارفين اللهم افتح علينا حكمتك وانشر علينا رحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام يا ذا الجلال والإكرام يا ذا الجلال والإكرام الحمد لله فرز الله سبحانه وتعالى is gathered is here الحمد لله for the blessed majlis and the salawat and the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم blessed gathering blessed moment thank Allah Allah will give you an increase inshallah Pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala includes others in these blessed gatherings as well. Amen. Just like Allah has bestowed that ni'mah upon you, you should have a real concern. Your iman cannot be complete until you want for your brother what Allah has given you. And what you'd like for yourself, you want for your brother. That's completion of iman. And we should really sincerely, and one of the striking distance, you know, differences between the older generation that went before us, that we saw glimpses of, and this generation is that that they truly wanted good for other people they were happy with other people's happinesses and successes when they heard that somebody had graduated or somebody started a new business they would actually from the bottom of their heart they would really really be you know thankful for him they would go on congratulate him with sincerity and they want to be there for his happy big day and we see that in a time only just in the one generation down you see a generation which almost like no one's happy with anybody else's. Everybody wants to show their happiness on f- social media and Facebook or whatever you have. And everybody wants to show it, but everybody's living these farce lives. So they're showing their happiness is only as a, as, as a, almost like a smoke screen of what really is hurting and burning inside. And nobody wants to show people what their good deeds are except unless somebody has some hasad over them or somebody has some nazar or evil eye upon their success or their happiness and this is the age that we're living in but we have an anchor and that is the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that reminds us no matter how bad times get that we always have him as a guide and it's hard when you're the only one who's going to be the one who's going to be standing up glad tidings are for the one who then stands up for the sunnah of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a time when it's been um, forgotten and it's been t- uh, taken apart piece by piece by the fitters that are coming in this time. So glad tidings are for those that are, who try to latch onto the beautiful seerah and the surah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The surah is what we're doing here. We're trying to see the surah of the beautiful you know, portrait of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in our shamail. So that we can know how he was, so we can be like him. The, the non-Muslims and those people who are in this world, many of them haven't read the Quran. Many of them haven't read the Hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. But they have seen you. They've seen you, they've interacted with you. And that's what they take the Islam off. If it's not from the screens and what, uh, what false rubbish that they can see on the screens then it's going to be from what you do and what you say and how you act and how you react. We have the anchor and we have to remind ourselves again and again. And if we don't remind ourselves, we're going to forget ourselves. Remind them for reminding benefits the believers one and all. Firstly, to the one who's going to say the ulama say. The one who says it, it reminds him. So the one who's speaking is the most mahtaj from amongst you. But then with reminding myself, inshallah, by extension, we're reminding all the listeners here today as well. And the Sahaba were doing exactly that. They were reminding the Tabi'een how it was when they saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This beautiful chapter, Faslu Rabi' we touched upon the beginning of it. It's the Na'al and the Khuf of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And like I said, it has special, the Na'al, the blessed sandals of the Prophet <coughs> has a beautiful um, asrar and hidden aspects of it and barakat and hasanat that you're not going to experience 
and it's because it's connected to the blessed feet of the blessed one that the Prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed himself sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's why it's special. Otherwise they were ordinary sandals but became elevated by the nisbah to the our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Same as the khuf or the socks of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam became elevated in special socks because of the nisbah that they had with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The khuf Fakhla na'alaik. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that word na'al, the sandals. Musa alayhi salam was told, take off your sandals because you're in a blessed vicinity or a blessed land. That's what Musa alayhi salam was told. But our Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, come as you are. Come as you are. Even if you've got your sandals on, doesn't matter. Come as you are because they're blessed. That's why the likes of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala, and why would he be the one when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam took his sandals off the, he would be the one who would take them and he would hug him close to his chest close to his heart under his arm and he would keep it as if he's getting something and, he's, and they would see that when the other sahaba would see him that they would ask Abdullah ibn Mas'ud he says give me a moment give me a moment and what they would ask was for him to just touch them on the top of their heads why? We're going to see the fadail of it. I don't even want to go into it. We don't want to even go into it. The musannif is going to spell this out for you. If you think that they're ordinary sandals, then keep listening because this is you're going to change your perception of what these sandals are of the Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They're not our Nikes or whatever you have or Adidas or whatever you want to have. These are the special ones of the Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was the sahibun na'al. He was the one who was the one who held and looked after the sandals of the Prophet. ﷺ. He looked after the wisada, the pillow of the Prophet. ﷺ. He looked after the siwak. He looked after the miswak of the Prophet. ﷺ. And he looked after the fourth thing, which is the tahur, or the, the uh, utensil that the Prophet ﷺ would use for wudu and for cleaning himself with. He would you, look after all them things. This is the, the sharaf that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. What did Abdullah ibn Mas'ud get? You can see all of his, I mean, time is too short as you can read. All the fada'il that you got was because of the nisbah they had th- through these things. Looking after the items of the Prophet ﷺ. Just because the nisbah that he had with the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So first they're going to be trying to like draw for you what did the sandals of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa look like so did they have like were they black were they white did they have a strap here or did they have no straps did they have velcro on they're going to display to you and they're going to draw them for you so it starts off first hadith he says that they had qibalan so qibalan is going to be two um, straps if you will that went diagonally across they was would they were stitched onto the actual the base or the sole of the sandal itself. and he had two uh, shiraks. I, I'll explain. So qibalan is going to be almost like if you look at flip flops. So the the diagonal straps that you have that's going to be going the end where the the two straps meet are going to be between your toes or whatever. That's what the qibalan is going to be. And it had two straps further in some of them. Then it had two straps that went across the foot as well. So it looked like they're almost like the other slippers, if you will. The one that go across the foot itself, not just between the toes. This is the, the, the sandals of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wal qibal huwa zimamun yudahu bayn al usbu'i al wusta wa lati taliyaha wa yusamma shist an. So he's explaining, he says. That is the qibalan. Qibal is going to be the two straps are going to be meeting between the, the middle finger and the finger that, that almost like the not the toe but the other on the other side of the middle finger of the toe. This is the, the way that the, the Prophet ﷺ would have this flip flops of his, if you will, the sandals. وَكَانَ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ يَدْعُ أَحَدَ الْقِبَالَيْنِ بَيْنَ الْإِبْهَامِ وَالَّتِي تَلِيَهَا وَلَا so he says sometimes so, so the straps they would meet at two places with his toes one would be between the big toe and that which is next to it the middle finger 
and the middle, and the second one will be meeting between the middle and the one that came next after it. So it will be meeting in two different places, and there will be, if you can to understand it, you have to know how to walk in um, sandy terrain. If you have these normal flip flops, after a while, what's going to happen is that it's going to either burn, i.e., it's going to cause the friction between your shoes and your skin, or it's going to break away after a little while. That's how it is to walk in he heavy sand sandy areas, if you will. And that's why he needed that reinforcement of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says, Washirat as said, the straps. وَأَنْ إِبْنِ عُمَرْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَلْ أَنْهُمَا أَنَّهُ كَانَ يَلْبَسُ النِّعَالِ سِبْتِيَّةِ وَهِيَ الَّتِي لَا شَعْرَ عَلَيْهَا Ibn Umar رَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَلْ أَنْ He says that, that the Prophet ﷺ would wear sandals that were sibti. So sibti, you're going to be, it was, it, it's, it's a description of the leather that it was made from. It was made from the cow's leather. And it was made, that it, that all this, the hair of the, the, the leather had been taken off before so it's almost like it's waterproof that it has nothing that can get wet and he says what so ibn umar says and i saw the prophet wear these sandals that were made of this cow tan leather that it had no hair upon it. It was all taken off. And he says, فيها, And the Prophet sometimes when he would wash his feet, he would wear that. He wouldn't, he wouldn't remove it when he would wash his feet. Obviously making sure that it goes through. But that's if it has hair on it, it gets soggy. It would get wet. And that's not what he would like. And the Prophet said that Ibn Umar says, he says, Because ever since I saw that, I always wanted to wear them. I always wanted to wear them. And that's the way the Prophet ﷺ would wear them, without the hair. And it would, it would be most of the time he would wear, when it, when it had tanned, not that it goes till the redness. He would like it when it was yellow in colour. So that's the first stage of tanning. So tanning traditionally used to be not done by acids and, and chemicals. They would traditionally, what they would do, they would leave the hide, they would take it off as much as they could, so it had just the skin itself and it would leave it in the sun. The first stage of tanning would be that it goes yellow and then all the hair almost like falls off. If you leave it past that, it goes red. If you leave it past that, it goes brown. So that's how the, the stages of tanning go. The Prophet would always like it in that kind of a color. So if he had a preference, like we said, the Prophet didn't have something that he insisted on. That's not him. He wasn't vain. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That I have to... Where's my yellow ones? I'm not going to wear these. I don't like these. That wasn't the way of my Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had... If he liked something, he liked yellow. Why? Yellow is a beautiful color. Why? Because it naturally gives you color therapy. They teach you in there. But our Quran told us that a long time ago. The Surun Nadirin. That it's one that gives you absolute happiness when you look at yellow. So yellow is a color that makes you really, really happy. And that's what the Prophet ﷺ, can you imagine seeing the Rasul ﷺ? That would make you happy in itself. And then seeing yellow on the Prophet ﷺ, that would make you even more happy ﷺ. What a mandat that would have been ﷺ. So Ibn Umar says, ever since I saw that, I wanted to wear them as well. I always only wore them ﷺ. When Ibn Umar, when Amr Ibn Huraith, and the next hadith, Amr ibn Huraith, the companion of the Prophet says, أَنَّهُ قَالْ رَأَيْتُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمُ يُسَلِّي فِي نَعْلَيْنِ مَخْصُوفَتَيْنِ أي مَخْرُوزَتَيْنِ ضُمَّ فِيهِمَا طَاقٌ إِلَى طَاقٍ the Prophet, He says, I saw the Prophet وسلم, praying salah in his slippers that were مَخْرُوزَتَيْنِ Ay Makruzate means he explain he says he says when it has a soul and he has another soul put on top of it or underneath it. So it makes it more firm, if you will. If you've got one soul, if you're walking in a rocky terrain sometimes, it's got gravel rocks, it can go through sometimes and it's a bit uncomfortable. Sometimes the Prophet would have another one put on top of it. So two souls they make it slightly thicker. And that he and he would pray in that. He would pray salah in that. And the hukum of wearing shoes inside your salah, permissible is ma'roof from the hadith 
of the Prophet ﷺ. If there's going to be obviously no najasa on it, if there's going to be nothing that's going to be of, of uh, a problem on the thing, if you're going to be praying obviously ins- inside of a masjid, which needs to, to keep maintain the tahara, so you don't obviously walk in with your, with your shoes on. So Mullah said, I can wear my shoes and said, you're going to get kicked out of the masjid very fast. That's not what we're intending. But if you are, for example, outside one day and you, and you want to pray, you don't want to take your shoes off and you're outside, then you can pray. It's permissible. Not to say that it is the sunnah. The Prophet did it. He did pray sometimes. Most often, we can understand it from the context that the masjid of the Rasul Sallallahu was a gravel. It had no carpet. It had no uh, mats that they put on in the early days. So it was gravel. So they would pray in sometimes. So they would pray inside uh, with their shoes on. That's not a norm over here. You just have to understand the context. وَعَنْ جَابِرِ بْنِ عَبْدِ اللَّهِ رَضِيَ اللَّهِ تَعَلَىٰ عَنْهُمَا أَنَّ النَّبِيَ صَلَّى اللَّهُ وَلَىٰ صَلَىٰ نَهَا أَنْ يَعْكُلَ يَعْنِ الرَّجُلْ بِشِمَالِهِ أَوْ يَمْشِيَ فِي نَعْنٍ وَاحِدٍ Famous hadith that the Prophet ﷺ says, Sayyidina Jabir ibn Abdullah, the great companion of the Prophet ﷺ, رَضِيَ اللَّهِ تَعَلَىٰ عَنْهُمَا Both of them, Jabir, best friend of the Prophet ﷺ. Son of Abdullah. Abdullah was the best friend of the Prophet ﷺ. Both of them are going to be very close to the Rasul. He's the Rawi or the narrator. The Prophet ﷺ, he, he, he prohibited all of us from uh, eating, any one of us eating with the, with the left hand. Or walking in one shoe. Okay, These are two prohibitions that the Prophet ﷺ gave. First one goes without saying... That you, the, the Prophet ﷺ would love things to be done, all things of sharaf to be done with the right. And we've covered this hadith before in the chapters that, are pre- uh, that came before. That the Prophet ﷺ loved everything to be in his right. Eating, he said, eat with the right hand because shaitan eats with his left. So we don't want to be like that person. He's an enemy. Take him as your enemy. Hate everything about him. Even the slightest nisbah to him, you should hate about him. And the opposite is the Prophet giving you a beautiful sunnah. He says, adopt it and love everything about him, sallallahu alayhi wa He says, or walking in one, fo- one shoe. So he says, firstly, it goes without saying, the ulama say, why? Why, why is it so? Yani, the ulama, if you look at the hukum, it, some say, the Malikis and the, the Hanbali say, it's haram to eat any, for anybody to eat with their left hand. If a person obviously has got absolute dying need, he doesn't have a right hand, for example. Allah protect us. Mm-hmm. Then he's, he's permitted. That's permissible. In the, in the Shafi school, for example, it's going to be makru to eat with the left hand. Unless, yani, if you're doing it out of, yani, just to be contrary to the sunnah, then it's something which is haram. But the point is, why did they mention, the, uh, the Prophet also mentioned about wearing one shoe? He says, firstly, because the Prophet also loved everything to be complete and beautiful. So if there's anything that looks shabby, he'll say, you, you know, neaten it up and make it straight. The Prophet says, this is a husn of a person, he's in the shoes. You can look at a person, when you walk in, when he's walking with some, some good footwear, it makes him look good, so that's good. And if he's walking with one, it looks incomplete. The second thing he says, going back to the first one, he says, because shaitan walks with one shoe. He loves it, he just loves to be tatty. So if there's a, if, if somebody gives him something, he'll, he'll, He'll mess it and then he'll want to do something that's, that looks shabby, that looks messy. That's not the way of the Rasul Sallallahu Everything's pristine and beautiful and good. And everything's complete and everything has to be nicely ironed and it has to be you know, almost, if you can use the word, slick. That's the way the Prophet Sallallahu Sunnah was. Go on Abi Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala. Anna Nabiya Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam aqal Idhan ta'ala ahadukum fal yabda' bil yameen Famous hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, when any of you wear your shoes or your sandals, then you should wear, you should start with your right. And you put your right, then the left. And when you take it off, then you do the opposite. You start with by removing the left and then the, the right. The sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. So we hear these, but how many of us do this? The Prophet ﷺ, when he's taking his shoes, sunnah, he used to sit down and he used to do that. And so should, that's why you see most of the masajid Fortunately, we ain't got the space for it here But they were usually on benches over there Sunnah To sit down and actually take your shoes off And wear your shoes And take them off The Sunnah of the Prophet How many of us hear it but we don't you know, How many of us are going to do 
How many of us are going to choose the right side now to when we put our sandals and our shoes on? How many of us are going to go and get actually a pair of sandals to wear now? Because it looks cool because my Rasul وسلم, has it. وسلم. As, as we mentioned, it says the first one when you're putting it on is going to be the right, and when you're taking it off, it's going to be the left. That's the way that the Prophet would love to have things done. And when the Prophet would be would be invited or called to a gathering, or he would sit down to talk with anybody. He would take off his sandals. He would sit down, he would take off his sandals. And the reason why he would do that is because it would be almost like termed as something like rude uh, shoes. Are you were waiting to go? The Prophet would give the full attention to the people. Allah. The Prophet also would, yani, I'm here, I'm, I'm listening to you, I'm talking. We're having this conversation, I'm taking my shoes off, I'm not going anywhere. When you stop, I'm going to go. That's what he used to do. When the Prophet also would be stopped in the street, when somebody would shake his hands and hold his hand, he wouldn't be the one who would take his hand away until that person t- took removed his hand. That's and the problem. And sometimes the, the Sahaba would see that some of the the Bedouins would come and they would trouble the Prophet so much that they would know that the Prophet was in a hurry. Like one of the one of the times when the Prophet had a, a nikah done with one of his wives, and the Bedouins came to congratulate him and. They were having the feast and the Prophet was almost like looking like it's my wedding day here. And they would just carry on talking and talking. And the Prophet just wouldn't he would he wouldn't be able to tell them that guys come on, I need to go now. I said, you know, it's my wedding night and yeah. you guys need to go now. The wedding's over. You've had your feast now, you can go. And they carried on talking until it took Umar radiallahu ta'ala, the one who had to tell us, come on guys, can or as Ali in another riwayah. He says, Can you not tell the hint guys? Go, it's his wedding night. So, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That's the the humbleness of the Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam. قال الباجوري إمام باجوري رحمة الله عليه says كانت نعله sallallahu alaihi wasallam مخسرة مؤقبة ملسنة. So all these are the descriptions of the Rasul. The sandals of the different types of the Prophet sallallahu shoes or the sandals that he had. كما رواه uh, Ibn Sa'ad in, in Tabaqat of Ibn Sa'ad he's mentioned the different types of shoes that he had. We touched upon this last time. So he says, explain it. He says, Mukhassara hiya lati laha khasrun daqiqun. So the Mukhassara is that type of sandal that has a, a thinner part in the the khasr, the middle part, if you will. So the two ends, the front and the back, would be the wider parts, and the, the, the thin thinner part would be the middle part of the, the sandal. والمؤقبة, the second type هي التي لها أقب أي سير من جلد من في مؤخر النعل يمسك به أقب القدم so مؤقبة is going to be that it has a sandal in the normal sense with the two straps but at the back of the heel that it had another like a wider strap if you will that held the, the heel in place and, or gave support and protection to the back of the heel he says, well, mulassana. He says here, from lisan, you can understand. He alati min muqaddami ha tulun ala hayat lisan. That he had, that he was in a normal sense that he had the two straps, but the front of the sandal was almost like wider. It came out that it almost looked like the shape of a tongue, if you will. So he had like a tongue that was sticking out wider than even the toes. That was for protection if he was going to a rocky terrain or something. These are the, the feet, don't forget, that wasn't shy of walking to Ghari Hira every single day. Those people who have been to Makkah, Medina, and so rather Makkah, have they seen Ghari Thawr? Have they seen Ghari Hira? It's not a short distance. These are the sun, you know, these are the feet we, we spoke about, the firmness of the feet of the Prophet. ﷺ. They weren't shy of work, they weren't shy of you know, walking. These, these are not ones that used to ask for the conveyance to come everywhere he wanted to go. The Prophet ﷺ did his own work. The Prophet ﷺ walked for his own errands. And the Prophet ﷺ's feet were those that if he had to have gone rocky terrain, that he would walk. Sometimes he wouldn't. And he comes in the riwa, it's not mentioned here, but he mentions in the ahadith that the Prophet ﷺ would wear shoes 
whichever charity he went on. And he would wear it as a norm that he would wear sandals that he, wherever he went. Except when he would go to visit, for example, an ill person when he did iada. When he goes to visit an ill person, he would go barefooted. And the ulama say, why? And the Prophet of the Sahaba would ask him, they said, why would you, why, why'd you go barefooted? He says, because I know of the number, sheer number of angels that are accompanying me around my feet at that time. He says, because and this is a blessed land because of the angels that are surrounding me. When you go visit an ill person, there's 60,000 angels that are almost like hovering around you, walking on the land in front of you, walking behind you, walking to the side of you, waiting to say, I mean, and anything that you say. This is the blessing. The Prophet would be barefooted. He said, this is Wadi al-Muqaddasa. This is a special land. He says, I don't. I want my feet to touch that ground. That's specialness. Allah give us tawfiq. Hiya alati muqaddamaha tulun ala hayat al-lisan. Qal al-hafid al-kabir Zainuddin al-Iraqi. It's a beautiful poem. You have to go into this. It's beautiful. It's Imam al-kabir Zainuddin al-Iraqi. Hafidhullah rahmatullah alayhi. He, say, he mentions in his thousand line poem. So you know when you, you hear it this as a lot, Alfiya ibn Malik. What's the Alfiya? Why do they mention them? Alfiya, they don't mention it just as a, a fancy name for their book. It's because they've done a poem which is a thousand line long. So it has thousand lines. That's what they call the Alfiya. So the Alfiya of uh, Iraqi, he's going to have one. It's called Alfiya to Sirat al Nabawi. On the Seerah of the Prophet, so he's in a poem. That has a thousand lines just in the in the beautiful seerat of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Ala sahibha afdalu salat wa salam. He says, "Wa na'alhu al-karima al-masuna tuba lima masa biha jabina." Now they're going to tell you what the speciality of the falila of this blessing sandals. You've heard about the sandals. You've almost got a beautiful maybe description. He says, but what is the sandals? He says, you, you really, really don't know. He says, halfway through, he stopped. The ahadith is telling you this. He says, now I need to go off on a tangent and make sure that you know what kind of na'az that I'm talking about. So he says this poem, he says, of uh, Zainuddin al-Iraqi, rahmatullahi alayhi. He says, he says that the blessed noble sandals that were, that were almost made for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, what were they? He says, Tuba, glad tidings for the one who it touched their blessed foreheads with. In that, in our, our day of uh, calling uh, you know, everything bid'ah, he said, he says, he goes, make sure he touches your forehead. Then blessed sandals are worthy of touching on your head. Laha qibalan bisayrin wahuma sibtiyatani sabatu sha'rahuma. So he's mentioning in his beautiful poetic form, and I can't give it justice, the, the, the Arabic is just too beautiful. He's explaining the two blessed straps that he had on it. He says they were beautiful, and the leather and the material that he had, that he was absolutely free of any hair. He says, wa shibrun wa isba'an. He says, if you wanted to look for a, a description, he goes, I'm drawing it out for you. He says, shibrun, he says, two hand spans, or two hand widths apart. He says, plus two fingers. So he says, two fingers... That's the length of it. He says, وَأَرْضُهَا مِمَّا يَلِيَ الْكَعْبَانِ And the width is if you looked at the blessed, like the ankles of the Prophet Wasallam, the two bones that stick on the on both like sides of the ankles of the Prophet Wasallam, you'd be in line with that. So you can draw it now if you want. And others have tried to draw it. And they've got the exact measurements. How much is a shibr? Two hands. Yeah, look, at, look at the two hands if I can show you. Those who can see it. That. And then two fingers on top of that. What's the hands of the Prophet Sallallahu How would he measure? How would them blessed feet be Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Allah Allah. Sab'u asabi'in wa batnul qadami khamsun wa fawqa dha fa situn fa'alami He says six fingers wa batnul qadami khamsun. So he says, he says, at the ends there were seven uh, fingers if you will. And in width in some of the shoes, and he says in the middle there were five. So that's the other description that they mentioned. Mu'akkaba. He says wa fauqa He says and sometimes the front was slightly wider, and that was six uh, in in length, um, slightly wider. 
ورأسها محدد وأرضها ما بين القبالين سبعان إضبطهما. He says the front of them sometimes was was bigger and wider. وأرضها ما بين القبلة إسبعا. He says and some of them that they would accommodate between his fingers. There were the middle one which was the longest one, if you will. وهذه مثال تلك النعلي ودورها أكرم بها من نعلي. He says this is the uh, the outline or the the portrait or drawing of the na'al of the Prophet sallallahu uh, uh, sandals wa and his blessings akrim biha min na'li is his sandals are the best of all of sandals fa'ida qala fil mawahib dhakar ibn asakir timthal na'lihi he says so he goes he was trying to give you a glimpse of the outline and the description so you might get a picture of it you've seen the pictures haven't you people have got the you know na'al the blessed na'als They've got the beautiful description of it, of how it was. Imam Tirmizi has got a big section. He says, he says, note in the Mawahib al dunya of Imam Qastalani, rahmatullahi, he says the Ibn Asakir, he says, mentions in his book. So Ibn Asakir, the great historian, he mentions, he says, Timthalu na'li salas fi juz'i, juz'i mufredin. So he's dedicated in his book, He's mentioned a full volume just to the Na'al of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Just one full volume. And if you think it's a few pages long, one volume is hundreds and hundreds of pages long. Just on the Na'al of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so you can get a picture of it. He says, وَأَفْرَدُهُ بِالتَّعْلِيفِ أَبُوْ إِسْحَاقْ إِبْرَاهِيمُ بْنُ مُحَمَّدِ بْنِ خَلَفِ السُّلَمِ الْأَنْدَلُوسِ وَكَذَا غَيْرُهَا and if you want to look at those who have wrote books about it, just on the topic of this, he says the likes of Abu Ishaq, the, the great the Sulami, who's an Andalusian great scholar, he was a great wali of Allah. He's wrote just a book on it on just that on that topic, as well as have others. He goes, I'm just giving you these names just as an example. That's telling you how much description, how much they, they knew the, the blessings of it. Qala walam uthbitha. He says, and it could be not even hidden the greatness of or the how famous the description of the Prophet sandals are. Who can give, who can tell you the sandals of uh, Napoleon or any of these other people that passed through our history? And he, did he wear? You can you see his hat. Give us the description of it. How long was it from side to side? How long was it? His coat that he was famous of wearing, Winston Churchill. Go on, show us, show us, go on. Show us his description of how his, how his tailor would make his pants or whatever you have. And then look at how the description, the exact measurements of the sandals of my Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa was. But he says, he goes bringing it into context. The Musannif, the author of the, this Shamail, he says, despite of his shahrat and his vastness and his how beautiful it was. He says, He says, but it's only for the people who are hazik. I the ones who know, no. I those are the ones he's, he's saying out of his absolute humbleness. He says, I'm not one of them. He says, and because of that, he says, I didn't mention it in this book. He says, but I've given you indications to where you can find it. So he said, I'll give you indication. That's just his humbleness. He says, in case I get something wrong, he says, I'm not one of those that are, you know, this time, these, these are the historians, the lovers of the Prophet, so some know the exact measurements. And some of the fadail of it, he says, Others have mentioned, and this is mujarrab. What does mujarrab mean? Mujarrab means tried and tested throughout history. So these are the things that are going to be telling you what the barakah from the na'al of the Prophet ﷺ was. He says, and before somebody tries to tell you that where's your dalil, is it in Bukhari and Muslim? As they do. He's telling you that this is tried and tested throughout history and it's too much that you can't, that you can't take it serious. Mujarrab. He says, Anna Abba Ja'far. Abba Ja'far, Ahmed ibn Abdul Majid first was going to tell you. He said, Salih. 
He was one of the greats of this ummah. He's a great uh, sheikh of this ummah. أعطى مثالها لبعض طلبة. He says he gave when he was teaching his 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 students. He gave them all a description of the the outline of the sandals of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And so each of them drew around it, and they've taken their own copies home. And he told them the fadila of this. He says you get barakah from this. You get whatever you get. This is just don't forget they've just taken. The outline of the description that they've give the teachers give, yes. Allah. Who's this? About Abu Jafar Ahmad ibn Abdul Majid. Fajahu wa qala. He says one of the one of the students comes back the next day, and he says to his, his teacher, he says, al bariha min barakati hada nal ajaban. He says, Oh Sheikh, I saw a ajib thing through the baraka of this nal. This outline that you gave the the, the prophetic sandals, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Asab zaujati wajun shadidun. Kada yuhlikuha. He says, my wife, she she started with such a severe pain suddenly, and she was close to she was on the verge of death. She was going to die. That's how hard it was. Fajaltu naal ala mauld al waj. So I remember that you told me that these great blessings. In the Naal of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam I took it and I put it on the place that was hurting my wife وَقُلْتُ And I said اللهم أَرِنِي بَرَكَةُ صَاحِبِ هَذَا Naal. Oh Allah, show me the barakah of the one who has these sandals And the one the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam فَشَفَاهَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى لِلْحِينَ Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala gave instant shifa there and then on the spot and he's coming back to tell the tale. Now call it Jack and Ori stories if you want. That's not for the likes of that student who witnessed it. And likes of hundreds and hundreds who witnessed it. He said, if you don't believe me, let's read on. وَقَالَ أَبُوْ إِسْحَاقِ قَالَ أَبُوْ الْقَاسِمِ بِنِ Muhammad. Abu Ishaq again he mentions وَقَالَ أَبُوْ الْقَاسِمِ ibn Muhammad mentions وَمِمَّا جُرِّبَ مِنْ بَرَكَتِهِ From the things that, I, that, that was witnessed <laughs> And tried and tested. He says, We told the people about the barakah. And then whoever took the outline of the Prophet sandals, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, it would be for them eyewitness. And these are the walis of Allah. He said, We witnessed that he became a source of protection from the the almost like the transgressors of the Dalibin. Those people that would try to attack them, it would be a hills, it would be a barrier for, for anything that would come their way. And it would be a protection from enemies that would try to attack them. And anybody would have like jinns and shaitans that would attack them, these, these wretched, evil spirited jinns. It would be a protection against them. And it would be a protection against Ain. Yani the bad eye, evil eye. Wa in amsatta hul hamil bi yaminiha wa kadishtadda alihi al talik. Ta yasar amruha bi hawli laahi wa kuwatihi. He says if there was a, a woman who was in the, in, the, in the midst of labor and she would hold the outline, simple outline of the Naal of the Prophet in her right hand and she was in the, yani the pains of labor. She would have an easy labor without any pain by the howl of Allah, by the, by the might and the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? It isn't the, the pencil line that does it, but it's the nisbah that is in the outline of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَمَا أَحْسَنَ قَوْلَ أَبِي بَقْرٍ قُرْتُبِي There's another poem and it's too good to skim over. We don't have time. We'll continue inshallah in this blessed fada'i that we're going to be mentioning. Of the Nahl of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam I had an absolute sore throat And I was full of a cough Alhamdulillah by the birth of the Nahl of the Prophet I have coughed once Alhamdulillah May Allah give us all shifa inshallah May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless everybody By the nisbah of the blessed sandals May Allah keep us always under Our heads always under the Nahl and the shade of the sandal Of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 11th of July And it's one of them days that we always remember those of uh, the, the, the lost their lives from our br brothers and sisters, and more so the brothers Shrebenitsa on the 11th to the 20s, 22nd, or whatever it was. I was there earlier this year and I saw 
the other hand of it, all those, you know, thousands of, you know, the, the men that were, that were slaughtered and killed in the name of their faith. We have to remember them, give them a portion of our du'as, pray for them, they're the mazlumin. When you go there, you see the, almost a land praying for them. It was a surreal day when we went and visited the graveyard. It was almost, yani, when you visit the shohada, you could feel their presence. The names are all etched there, and they were in unmarked graves almost like, you, you couldn't even see because they had to redig their bodies or whatever you found them in the woods or whatever they were, and brought to some central, this Shrebenitsa memorial site. But you can see that the strength in, we prayed Yasin's that day, and nobody wanted to gather over that place. So us with our group, we got, we raised our hands, we prayed Yasin, we made a dua. As soon as we started making a dua, we saw that the whole village started to come out and everybody, before, I didn't even know, the, the whole village had come out just to you know, be participants in the dua that we were making. And there are tears in the eyes that brought tears to our eyes. They went through that and they are all still going through that. And they're the people that are the remnants of that beautiful time. Those men that lost their lives have lost their lives. They're six feet under, but they're alive. There's no doubt that they were shuhada. They were those that stood firm for their faith. And we should make a dua for them and not forget them. We should honor their, 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 their taking wasn't in vain. That they gave their lives, but they, we can remember them and learn from them. We can have strength of our faith through them. You should, you should have a portion of your du'a to remember them. So in our remembering the na'al of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings safety, aman and security to Shrebenitsa, Bosnia and all them places where Muslims reside. All the way in the world, especially in Gaza, in Palestine, in Syria and even in these lands where we reside. May Allah protect our iman. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and our honor and our lives and our properties. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us a source of good and khayr and barakah for all those around us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those who bring people together, Muslims and non-Muslims together. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unify our hearts. And may Allah keep us in the shade of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Sunnah, his blessed sandals, and may we be raised on the Day of Judgment in his blessed gather, in his group, with the whole of the Prophet that we never feel thirsty thereafter.